Hear these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 and following. It'll be up on the screen in your Bibles as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 and following. It says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I, too, try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what's best for me. I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth says, You should imitate me as I imitate Christ, or as another way to put that, following me as I follow Christ. Now that's a pretty bold statement on the surface. That's asking a lot. He's inviting the people reading this to model his best efforts to live this life of faith, even in his shortcomings, even in his weaknesses. He invites this church in Corinth and us today to follow his example And for this church in Corinth, God has strategically placed Paul in their path to help lead and guide and mentor them, to be a role model for them. It's not by accident. And as we'll see this morning, God puts people in our lives for a reason. As we lead off this morning talking about the Apostle Paul, we need to quickly realize that he's not shying away from the opportunity in this church in Corinth to be a role model. People are looking to him for guidance, for an example on how best to live. The Apostle Paul visited this church during his second missionary journey. He lived with Aquila and Priscilla as a tent maker. He's going to synagogues and to the common places to teach that Jesus was the promised Messiah, something that this town in Corinth may have not ever heard. A little while later, Timothy and Silas joined him, and his ministry increases. Soon the whole town has heard this message of Jesus. And as more people come to know Jesus, the opposition grows stronger and stronger. The Apostle Paul was so impactful with his preaching that not only the the pagans, but the synagogue leader and his entire family come to know Jesus. This is outlined in the second half of the book of Acts and also mentioned in parts of the Corinthian letters. The Apostle Paul has just come from Philippi, where he'd been punished for his message and beaten. He tells this Corinthian church that he comes in weakness with great fear and trembling. Something we may not necessarily associate with a role model. Paul stays in Corinth for a year and a half, laying the foundation of the church and preaching the message of Jesus Christ, which is that foundation. And after that time, he leaves and others come to minister to this church in Corinth. It's shortly after Paul leaves that rumblings start to take place. People are not happy with the leadership that Paul is showing, and the spiritually immature Corinthians have all sorts of issues that start to come up. They have issues regarding communion, members of their church suing each other, questions on marriage, and they even have a very wild view of the resurrection. Down to what foods could be eaten did they squabble against each other. Upon hearing these verses, upon hearing these issues, excuse me, Paul writes to the church and he sends a letter that we now have known as 1 Corinthians. I share all of these words and all of these things because as Paul writes these words, follow me as I follow Christ, he's writing this to a group of people who are very young in their faith. Paul is saying, if any of you are looking for a role model, someone to shape their faith after, please come to me. Please don't go to the Greek pagans of the town. Please don't follow the philosophers of the Sophist movement going on. Don't follow the Hellenistic Jews who are asking for the signs of Messiah. He says, no, 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 no. Follow me as I follow Christ. 
Now, usually I'm pretty skeptical when someone comes into town and says, hey, you there, yes, you, I'm a role model. You should come follow me, okay? I know exactly how to do this life. I'm a role model, okay? I'm really skeptical of someone who comes to do that. The position of a role model should take time. It should develop with trust as we trust the example that is given before us and trust is built over time. But before Paul writes this famous phrase, he gives us a context of how we should live our lives and how he wants to live his life. He says this in the very first part of this, in verse 31. He says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. He said, regardless of what you're doing, do it all for the glory of God. At home, at work, at play, anywhere you go, anything you do, Do it all for the glory of God. Now this statement butts right up against what some of us have when it comes to temptation, when it comes to our faith. We like to have our faith in a little box. And we put that box on the shelf, and when we need it, we take the box off the shelf, and we read the Word, and we pray the prayer, and then when we feel better, we put the box back on the shelf, and we don't take it off again until Sunday morning comes, or we need it again. It's sometimes the temptation we have when it comes to our faith. But Paul says, no, 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 no. In everything that you do, do it all for the glory of God. Realize that nothing changes about the status of your faith as you drive to work, as you sit at your desk. Nothing changes about the status of your faith when it comes to going to the gym and working out. Nothing about your faith changes when you go to school or when you're studying or when you're by yourself. Paul says all of these moments, down to cooking dinner and even taking out the trash, do it all for the glory of God. The Apostle Paul writes something else prior to this famous statement that we've been looking at this morning. He says this later. He says, I don't just do what's best for me. I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. I think it's a pretty good statement to model our lives after. Sounds like something a role model would say. As we think about the role models in our lives, as we think about the statements that they would make as he says, I I don't just do what's best for me, I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. I think it's important to, to grasp the characteristics of a role model, what they would say, what they do. For me and the role models that I've had in my life, they all share some pretty common characteristics. One, they're very comfortable in their own skin. 99% of the time for me, role models that I've seen uh, have had their identity wrapped up in Jesus. They're very comfortable with who they are. They don't need affirmation from anyone. They don't need anyone to sprinkle fairy dust on them and tell them how great they are. No, no, no. Their hope comes from God. And they know that their identity is wrapped up in Jesus. They're comfortable with who God has made them. And you know that Jesus is continuing His promise to work in their lives. And out of this knowledge then, these royal models show love and compassion. They love their families. They love their church. They love the people that surround them. They are compassionate people. They're compassionate in great times. They're compassionate in hard times. Their love and compassion is unwavering. And this shows as they care for others. Another characteristic that I see in the role models that I've had. Our passage this morning tells us that Paul doesn't do what's best for him. He does best for others so that many may be saved. Notice that it doesn't say I do what's best for others so that I feel good. Which is a temptation as we serve others. To relish the good feeling we have about ourselves. But Paul's point is so much greater, so much bigger. He says, I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. The role models that I've had in my life had a focus on others. They've cared for others. Not because it made them feel good, but because they wanted people to know the power and redemptive quality that Jesus has and what He's done for us. He wanted people to know... I'm thinking of a a specific role model in my mind right now. He wanted them to know, wanted me to know, that Jesus died for me. 
He died for you. And Jesus has defeated death for me and for you. And in his resurrection, we have new life. I don't just do what's best for me, Paul says. I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. Another characteristic of the role models I've seen and followed is that there's a willingness to express their faith. Notice this isn't wearing their faith on their sleeve. It's not obnoxious. It's not the traditional Christianese sayings. No, the role models that I've seen and followed have had the willingness to express their faith when the moment is right. When God has opened the right door for that message to come through. They're intuitive when it comes to the conversations that need to happen. They have the right words. They have the right questions. And they know what to bring up when it comes to talking about their faith. It's done in an authentic way, in a way that changes lives. These are just some of my thoughts on the characteristics of role models that I had, but we're going to take it one step further. I've asked some of you about the role models that you've had, and I want you to take a moment to look at what some of our congregation members have said about the role models they have in their life. Hi, Jeff. Who's one role model that you have? My father, my and, father. And, and why is your father a role model? He taught me to be nice to people, do what's right, and to, uh, to work hard. To just some really good, solid traits. So Shirley, who would you consider to be a role model and why? Only one? But instead of naming one individual, I think I'll tell you a category. A teacher is a wonderful model a role model for anyone, a teacher who encourages, insists that you do the best you can, someone who gets to know you well enough that he or she would uh, say that you must persist, you must follow your dream, and in many cases, uh, a person who overlooks what weaknesses you might have. My role model is Austin Forkner. He's a uh, pro uh, pro dirt bike rider, and he uh, he inspires me because he's he's a really young pro dirt bike rider, and he just proves that you don't have to be a specific person to um, achieve goals that are that seem larger than life. And um, and I think I can l relate that directly to my faith journey, and um, and just kind of put that towards anything in life. Abby, what's one role model that you have? My mom. And why is your mom your role model? Because she supports me and inspires me to do everything I love and she donated a kidney so that's pretty amazing. So who is your role model? My grandma and she raised 13 children all by herself. Very poor but she raised them all with love and she never worried. She trusted God that whatever came her way, that God was going to take care of it. And I've always uh, wanted to be that. That's what I wanted to be. No matter who you were, when you were with her, she made you feel like you were her most favorite person in the whole world. And so that's the kind of grandma that I always wanted to be. And I hope I am. Henry, who's your role model? Bill Self, the Kansas basketball coach. And why is he your role model? He's my role model because the things that I've read, he is always there for his family and whoever needs him, no matter what. Hands down, my most important role model has been my father. Um, he was the person that uh, uh, took Jesus into every part of his life and uh, it taught us as his sons to do the same thing. and and uh, and And that was the the greatest training that we could ever have and, and the greatest example of someone that, that just really lived out what it meant to be a Christian. Peggy, what's one role model that you have? That would be my mother-in-law, Margot O'Rourke. Her faith is amazing. It's huge and she shows such grace and mercy every single minute of every day. She's just an awesome lady. I want to say a, a big thanks to all of those who shared their role models and I hope uh, through that and through our, our talk this morning, you will see that all of us have had role models in our lives. Some may be great, some may be not so great, but I pray that yours have been intentional about leading you to Jesus. But what I want to do right now is this. 
I want to give you a minute to think about the role models that you've had in your life. Maybe one right now, maybe one that maybe has passed away or, or from your childhood. And I want you to think about how they have shaped your life or how they're currently shaping your life. I want you to write down their, your, their name. It's uh, in your notes. There's a spot. This is my role model in blank. And I want you to write down why, just for a second. I want you to write down a phrase, something that sticks out to you as you think about these role models that you have. So take a minute, think about a role model that you have, and write out why right now. Now, as you wrap that up, I imagine many of you could sit and write for days as why these people are, their, are your role models. Now, I, I do this for two reasons. One, I hope we get a chance to give thanks for the role models in our lives. Hopefully, you thought of someone pretty quickly, and I hope that we can all give a big thank you to God for the role models that we've had in our life. Maybe this week, take some time and thank your role model if you're able to contact them. Think God puts people in our lives for a reason and we should recognize the blessing that God has provided. So that's one side of it, to give thanks for the role models that we have in our lives. And secondly, and this is the part that's a little more mind-blowing for me, my guess is that some of you looked around the room and maybe put someone down that goes here to light of the desert. Now maybe it's a parent or a grandparent. Maybe it's uh, someone you're close to through a Bible study or through a class. Uh, maybe it's someone that you've connected with just having coffee here and, and donuts here at, here at church. But you've put someone down that goes here. And you look at their lives and you look at the lives of those in our congregation and you want to model your life after theirs. And here's the even bigger kicker. Is that many of you are probably role models to other people and you have no idea they're looking up to you. Most of us play this off and say, oh, I'm just living my life, there's nothing special to see here. Except that there is something special. Something incredible. As you live your life, you have the opportunity to impact a bunch of people. People that you know, but also people that you don't know who are looking to you as a role model. Going back to our text, the Apostle Paul says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And you could add, because you never know who's watching. You never know who's looking to you as an example. I think of the role models in my life, and I think some of them knew I was looking to them for guidance. But my guess is that there were several who had no idea I was watching their faith. My point here is this that we need to realize our opportunity for influence and impact even when no one's watching or we don't think anyone's watching. When you think of your influence and you all have influence, when you think about who you're directly impacting, think also about the people who you are impacting on a secondary level. The people who see you as a role model but might not have expressed that outwardly. How are you living your life? Then comes the question. And what are you bringing to the table? Are there habits and hang-ups that people are seeing that you would not want to pass on as a role model? Maybe it's an attitude that you carry around, good or bad. Maybe it's a hiccup in your faith walk. Or maybe it's the language you use. Or maybe even it's the way you drive as you whip in and out of traffic. Or maybe it's the language you use while you drive. Just a thought. Maybe it's the eating and drinking habits. Maybe it's a devotional time or lack thereof. What we don't realize sometimes is that whoever is looking up to you as a role model picks up these traits, picks up some of these characteristics, especially if they live in your house or are a part of your family, immediate or extended. What we don't realize is that the person that is looking up to you can pick up all of your good characteristics that you display and maybe some bad ones too. <laughs> My friends, no one is asking you to be perfect in this walk of life, but are there certain things in your life 
where it's just been easier to let things slide. Those who look up to you might pick up on those as well. So, role models, how are you living your life? And what are you bringing to the table? And in turn, as we bring this full circle, as you look at your life, who are you influencing? Who in your life is looking up to you? And at the same time, who are you allowing to influence you? Who are you allowing to speak into your life? Are these role models pointing you in the right direction? Are they encouraging you in your faith? Is it a good example to follow? Maybe it's time for some new role models. Not a bad thing. Or at least redefining how much they influence your life. Like I said in the beginning of this, God puts people in our lives for a reason. Some to learn from, some to help guide and mentor, some to encourage you in your faith. My hope in bringing this to light this morning is that as a church, we can be more intentional about who we let speak into our lives and also more intentional about the faith displayed for the ever-watching world because you never know who's picking up on your example of faith. My friends, let us pray together.